Happy Valentine's Day. This is the February 14th Open ZFS production user call. We have Andrew, Rod, Jan, Stu, Greg, Jim, and myself. And right off the top, Rob can't attend, but he's uh, reporting that the ZFS list dash TFS and dash T vol shorthand will hit 2.2.3. That came up in the last call and he started adding the feature during the call. Thank you, Rob. Let's see if you're tracking fast dedupe. The PRs are open and active, and they're trying to get that all wrapped up for release. So if that's of interest to you, take a peek. There's a link in the docs. And uh, I'm going to skip over the kerfuffle for now. Uh, let's see. So uh, Richard Elling, who's a rather wonderful person, made a comment that ZDB-L does not import a pool, just dumps the ZFS labels and uses a go-to command to determine if the disk has enough contents to worry about. Uh, has anyone bumped into that scenario thinking ZDB does not do what they want? I couldn't tell if he's proposing a different behavior, but if we don't care, we'll let him worry about it and communicate what he's after. Can't say I care personally. I know a lot of people get excited about ZDB hacking, but as far as I'm concerned, by the time you need to use ZDB, you should have already been reloading from backup. There you go. Appreciate it. And uh, go it's ahead. Alan, if anybody... That, Jim. <laughs> what was that, uh, Stu? I was going to say, if, if, if anybody's going to be paying attention to ZDB hacking, it's Richard Elling. He knows his stuff. <laughs> and I agree, he's one of the nicest people in the world. Cool. And Stu, you had something? Yeah, if, if you're digging into the guts of ZDB in a production environment, you have bigger issues and concur right. with Jim. Start sure. figuring out risk mitigation at that point. Perfect. And a recent Oxide and Friends covered Crucible, their storage stack, which had some interesting choice words about, oh, Ceph is something you operate, not just deploy and forget about. So you need staff to give it care and feeding. So I've put a link into the recording of that. So that said, uh, apparently there's been a Pharaonix kerfuffle, I'm guessing related to the open the native encryption that had some issues in 2.2. Oh, no, that would be... Okay, so the uh, Jim, do you want to introduce that? Sure. Uh, essentially, there, there's nothing really new here, except just in terms of, uh, you know, how widely the public is aware of it. There are some fairly hard-to-hit... Um, data loss possibility bugs that are related to native encryption and uh, send and receive. None of them seem to be, um, uh, it, it's not a worst case scenario for encryption bugs. People are reporting issues with like snapshots aren't available until they, you know, hold their mouth funny and reboot twice or something like that. Um, but while I frequently have a similar opinion of Pharonix as Michael expressed earlier, um, I think they've got the right in this one of actually talking about this problem. I mean, the fact is, yes, it's a little hard to hit. No, it's not, you know, the the nightmare scenario with an encryption bug, but we do have a data loss bug here, and I would prefer that we actually acknowledge it and talk about it rather than go the butter route and pretend that our shit don't stink. That's why I said that despite well-deserved um, derision, Pharonix isn't worth this because they are good at bringing attention to real problems too. Show of hands who's using native encryption and I'll start saying I am and I did encounter some issues but uh, nothing nothing data lossy yet. I do so not use it in I've... production. So far, I've always put Jelly with ISNI and able CPUs underneath. So uh, it's not enough of an advantage because I want all or nothing encryption to uh, recreate the pool. Okay. Um, I would dig deeper, but the ads are just kind of seem, uh, taking over the content there. In fact, I'll probably just close it to keep to get some CPU cycles back. But so they There's refer to the 
2.2 bug, which yes, was a bit obscure. And I'm guessing that's the uh, block, cl block cloning issue. And then 2021, this issue. Let's see if they've targeted that link. And clicky, clicky. And nothing. OK. So no, they didn't target. I'm impressed. Um, snapshots, post to dot O. OK. Debbie and Buster. <clears throat> And if I'm not mistaken, I haven't seen the word encryption yet, but maybe it's down the road here. It uses EFS crypto, the other use locks. Okay. Uh, what do we have that's actionable here? more testing. I don't know if I, I did hear uh, Ubuntu getting some flack for not updating to address the recent block cloning related issues in 2.2.2. Does anyone know if that's changed? Still catching flack for it and honestly, probably pretty deservedly so. Righty then. So yeah, let's uh, give that a read as we please. Jan, you've added some chat. Do, 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 do. Uh, and I know for those in FreeBSD land, there were some uh, CVEs to address maybe as soon as today. So take a peek at those. Welcome, Dan. So Dan, we've gone through the topics you see here. Happy Valentine's Day. And so to keep things moving along, uh, Greg, you've had some issues at work in production. Yeah, um, Monday I woke up, checked my email, and uh, seen that the uh, ZFS server that I was trying to pitch to the company um, has the possibility to use instead of um, third-party Isilon, Cumulo uh, vendors. Uh, that project, uh, the, the array was failed, um, so I logged in from home. And uh, the D message just showed uh, all 84 disks disappearing at once. Um, it ran some commands uh, like uh, F disk minus L and LS BLK and a few other things, and couldn't see any of the drives that were connected to the uh, HBA. And uh, LS PCI and DMI decode and whatnot were seeing the uh, HBA, and it appeared to be functioning. I could uh, get the firmware version off of it there's no messages in D message or the kernel log that indicated there's any sort of bus issues or anything so I rebooted the server um, and when it came back up it still wasn't seeing any uh, devices so I jumped in the car came in to work uh, rebooted the server or sorry I powered down the server and then I powered down the uh, JBOD and when I powered them back up they both came up as if nothing had happened. Um, file system, because there's a whole bunch of uh, HPC nodes, I made a little mistake. I guess I should have shut down all the jobs that were pending um, on the HPC. But uh, anyway, as soon as it came up, uh, the HPC slammed the drive, and it was just uh, reading and writing like it normally is. But it was like as if nothing happened. So I was pretty impressed that... Uh, that we didn't lose any data because all the special devices and the cache and the log drives, they're all on NVMe, which is inside the server itself, not on the HPA. Um, so I thought that we're gonna run into some issues. I even, in fact, preemptively reached out to Clara just to see how much it was gonna cost to engage them because this was in production. We are basically losing hundreds if not thousands of dollars every few minutes that this thing was down um, anyway thankfully it all came up and everything was was uh, great so i just want to say uh, again uh, zfs proved it's highly resilient uh, file system i was quite impressed but that's half the battle are you willing to share some details on 
HBA OS and disk model? I think Jan had a question about. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm I'm still I'm still in the um, because we want to get a root cause, right? I want to understand what happened. Um, as I said, the, the the OS scene, the only thing that the OS scene was a bunch of devices disappearing, and um, so I sent Diags to Dell, and they looked at it. We went through the lifecycle manager logs, and and all they could say is there's nothing wrong with your hardware, as far as we can see. So I uh, submitted a ticket to uh, Seagate, and um, that was a bit of an experience. Uh, they, they asked me for logs from one of the controllers right away. And then two days later, they asked me for logs off the failover, the redundant controller. Did you just cut out for anyone else? No. Uh, no, nope, he's been sounding good to me. Pissed? Yeah, okay, sorry. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. So two days later, they asked me for the logs from the second controller. And then I asked, you know, why, why didn't this fail over to the controller if there's a problem? And he said, well, send me the logs. And he said, well, it's been two days, so I can't really tell you what happened now. <laughs> so I was just like, why didn't you guys ask for the logs from both controllers, like on day one? Anyway, um, the fact that the disks all came up. So the fact that I rebooted the server and I still couldn't see the disks, and then when I rebooted the uh, disk array itself, everything came back up and normal. In my mind, I was saying something happened with the JBot. Um, because... I was saying that before you ever got to that point, just because all 84 drives disappeared and reappeared as one. I was like, well, we've got a, we've got a serious bottleneck there to, to look for, and it's going to be hardware. It's either cabling or controller or power environment in a JBOD, something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. So all this stuff's on a UPS, and this happened at uh, three o'clock in the morning, when absolutely no one was here. So, yeah. Um, so to me, it seemed obvious that there was a problem with the JBOD. Um, I don't Those think a reboot. Janitors at three o'clock. <laughs> yeah, that's possible, but I don't think so. They they're, they're usually in there around six or whatever, and out by eight. So well, janitors are uh, a con oh, job. I'm serious. Janitor comes off. in and starts up a floor polisher or something else, and and sends your 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 power for a bunch of high frequency noise that your ups doesn't see as a power failure but passes it anyway. Yeah, like a brown or harmonic distortion or something. Yeah. I um Greg, do you have do you have your scrub in cron? Um yes. Yep. What time um, did it match? Sorry, say that again. Does it match the time frame when this happened? Did it mask the time frame? Match it. Um, like, do you have any cron jobs if not a janitor at three a.m.? Oh no, no, no! Like, like it was like at like three seventeen or something like that. Um, right. So I yeah. personally have seen across JBODs and external external setups where a scrub will overload those on the, the versions of ZFS. Hmm. Interesting. Well, um, just like after it came up, uh, the, oh, one of the oh, one of the yeah one of the first things I did when it came up was fired off a scrub, um, and that took almost two days to run. Matter of fact, just finished yesterday, I guess. Um, but I haven't had problems with scrubs. But I get I get what you're saying. Um, maybe if we had another couple of JBODs on there, I could see that becoming an issue. Does but the JBOD uh, have any kind of IPMI that you can track logs on, or is it just a passive uh, unit? Uh, no, uh, Seagate gave me a, a, an application that I can run on the Linux host itself, and it communicates over the SAS bus to the uh, JBOD, um, and I was able to retrieve logs from there. That's and, cool. Yeah. So I got all those. I sent it to him, and he keeps saying that the um, – the only thing that he sees is me uh, power cycling it after it's been up for 180 some days. Uh, so I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm just going to move on, I guess, because the hardware, the, the server vendor Dell says there's nothing wrong on their end. And now I have Seagate telling me the same thing. So, Well, you know it's so, a JBOD issue because the drives didn't come back up when you rebooted the host without rebooting the JBOD. But then when you rebooted the JBOD, everything popped back online. So that yeah. tells you that the JBOD was, was messed know. up. Yeah, I even uh, challenged the uh, Seagate guy with that just today. I sent that back and I'm like, well, which scenario can you tell me that fits into the facts? You know, that 
that the um, discs didn't come back when the servos rebooted, but they did when the J bot is rebooted. So. Deranged J bot is pretty much it because you're you, you already weren't looking at the disc because all 84 popped off and on immediately. So you're you're going to be limited to something really central. Your obvious uh, your obvious possibilities are going to be the controllers, the cabling, and the J bod. If it was the controllers or the cabling, um, well, if it was the cabling, it wouldn't have resolved until you messed with the cables, and you haven't said you did anything physical. If it was the controllers, they would have either come back or stayed broken forever when you rebooted the host. But the only thing that would that would explain it coming back up when you reboot the J bod after rebooting the host is a problem in the JBOT, it being deranged. It sounds most likely, you said it's on a UPS, but it is entirely possible to end up with either a JBOD or a controller to get lightly deranged after a, uh, a power issue, something that makes it through a UPS, mind you, and it just leaves it wonky until it gets rebooted. Hmm. Um, Maybe, I, uh, I'm telling you, that's what this stupid, looks like to me. Maybe a stupid question, but do you... Uh, um, are the head node and the j bot on the same uh, phases of the power supply, or are, do they have their own UPS each? Um, I would have to go in and look at their wires, but they're both on okay. UPS. Because I don't know if they're so the same you, UPS. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I'm just thinking, could you have a DC offset or something? Between mm. um, that's but possible. Anyway, yeah, they're, they're in Sorry, the same uh, my chassis. My connection dropped out, so I missed the last two minutes or so. Oh. Okay. Um, I've I've documented the text there, but you did mention HA. What's HA about? Is two controllers with, with multi-pass SAS, or what? And if so, what controlling software? Um, yeah, so um, yeah. It, it's kind mm -hmm. of HA. <laughs> um, there's only one HPA in a Dell server, and yeah. that's mostly because the other slots have the uh, Honey Badger cards in it, the NV NVMe on PCIe cards, and we have the uh, the 100 gig NICs in there, so there's no more room. Um, mm -hmm. So so it's one HPA, but. Um, it's dual port, and uh, there's two controllers on the uh, JBOD. So, okay. they're, yeah, they're both plugged in. Oh, and can you reveal what software is controlling any failover? Or is that just you carefully exporting, making sure a pool is exported and pulling up the um, other one? Yeah, so I presented the uh, disks to, um, to... So we're using a true NAS. So if it's doing something uh, in the back end for the... The high availability, then um, I'm not aware of that, but I do know that it's multi path in and it's seen both disks and it just masked out the uh, the uh, redundant path in, in ZFS. So the OS is true, Naz? Yes. Because yeah. last I checked, they don't have an HA solution that's not on their own hardware with controllers interconnected with a non transparent well, bus or whatever. But I, uh, let me look here. It was the uh, MP path, I believe it was. Okay. Do be it between a scale or core or something else? It, it's scale, uh, the Linux variant. Okay. I have some stories from this week regarding that, but that can wait. Uh oh. I am, um, you know, I, actually, I don't know if I ever, yeah, I did. Actually, the first time I joined here, I think this is the reason why I joined. Um, I was trying to install FreeBSD on this server that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And no matter what I did, it wouldn't uh, install. And I believe I posted the link here to my plate in the FreeBSD forms, which I can paste again if you're... Sure, I'm all ears. Yeah. Cause... Let me just look that up quickly. A line to walk. Yeah. Uh, But I will caution you that it's not currently designed to have two controllers each share a path unless you're well you'll you'll very much be on your own. Uh, there's there's no like GUI support or otherwise beyond your careful housekeeping. Are you are you using straight multi are you using the multipath pseudo device or are you just letting it all sort itself out? Uh, uh, I believe it's multi-path. Sorry, I'm just trying to find that Literally. page. I, um, but uh, it recognized that it had multi-path, and, and uh, 
Let's see. So I forget what it asked because it's the first time I ever used uh, True Nats, and it just uh, acknowledged the fact that I had multipath, and and um, it went ahead and installed. And it's it's only using the uh, one path right now. Um, hmm. You can see that when you. Did Michael, did did they ever fix the multipath auto magic that we had such the nightmare with? So they are continuing to support it if you have multipath, but they are removing the feature from new versions because, yeah, it's not super solving real world problems. And or if it does, it creates about eight per problem it addresses. So, no, that's been kind of swept under the rug and is always a bit of a challenge. Um, if you attach all paths to the same HBA, it, they should only show up as one device so that it's transparent to the operating system. And you still get the bandwidth, but not the ability to fail over uh, HBAs. But HBAs, if they are not suffering from firmware problems, have been pretty reliable. And while I know where FreeNAS keeps multipath data on like the last block of a drive, I could not say where Linux keeps it. I'm all ears if someone knows. And while you look that up, I saw two versions of TrueNAS scale this week and uh, disk replacement with a disk with a with either partitioning and or a Z pool was not well handled by any kind of force command and required manual clearing, which often with most tools on Linux requires a reboot, but there's at least one that does not require a reboot. So I'm glad I eventually found that. And they do not yet support pool expansion by replacing in this case, four terabyte disks with eight terabyte disks. So that was a surprise. I guess it's a known issue. Oh, I see your post. Thank you. I will add that to the document. Thank you for that. Sure thing. So um, I will personally say I'm a bit nervous that you're trying to have two to hosts talk to the same multipath system when I don't think that's a supported configuration. Sorry, did, did you say two hosts? Well, it's... You mentioned failover. It's between pads or it's between two controllers, two servers it, with a pad yes. each. Maybe I misheard you. Yeah, I, I might have said it wrong too. Um, we have one server okay. that with with one one HBA that has two paths to the disks because Got it's it. a, yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um as Rod chimed in on, and I will say I haven't seen this on haven't experienced it with Linux, but uh I'm not convinced multi-path is solving a problem we truly have. Um, but that's, uh, I'll allow others to share their opinions. From from a Linux standpoint, I use it all the time. You do? And for yeah. performance yeah. or redundancy or both? Primarily redundancy, but okay. from that standpoint, I have not had an issue even over iSCSI doing cool. multi with ZFS on top, writing on top of it. As long our, as the one of our product, let him finish. <laughs> Go ahead, Stu. Uh, uh, one of our products is actually designed on that feature set. So, okay, cool. Jan, you had an observation. Um, block device level multipathing shouldn't pose any problems to the file systems as long as the block device uh, be behaves. So. SCSI multipathing should work. It's just that doing it via GIRM and FreeBSD has a few uh, annoying corner cases, but none of them would cause data loss. It's just that it doesn't, at least last time I checked, it didn't support direct dispatch. Uh, so it goes through the GIRM up and down threads, which limits throughput. And um, there is during uh, metadata testing, at least there used to be a corner case where if you have uh, basically an unrecoverable read error in an other GM provider's metadata, 
doing boot for system will just refuse uh, to boot because GM multipath will keep retrying infinitely mm -hmm. to read over both paths or all paths until all paths have failed and then we enable them and never give up in this corner case. Mm. Um, but you really basically have to have your primary or secondary partition table uh, corrupted by an unrecoverable read error for that to happen. Other topics? I never have an objection to a short meeting, so don't tempt me. What you got, people? <laughs> it's your meeting, not mine. <laughs> Have a look in chat. DCH wanted me to relay his uh, the bug that's hitting him. Oh, interesting. Let's take a look. Stopping uh, him from upgrading some hosts. CH is having interesting problem. Um, Greg, regarding your problem, I know you probably can't go back to try FreeBSD on a production system again, but um, there is a loader tunable to set the maximum uh, wait time for the root device. And I think you can even exclude certain device types from being waited for. Yeah, I um, sorry, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do that on the. Uh existing system but uh when when time and resources permit if we uh, buy a new server i can try and install on there i'd be more than happy to do it um and then just move the array over and do an import or whatever would be required but yeah i gave that a poke for a few days asked in multiple forums tried a lot of things that people suggested yeah Stu, you are not forbidden from saying you've got a great solution that your company provides because, hey, it's it's a fact, not an opinion or an emotion. It, it's expensive. <laughs> um, but no, it's... The only magical part about what we do is the management interface over top of it. So um, technology under, under the stack, there are some features of that, but depends on how big you get. And if you're in the petabyte range, there's a completely different platform that does some extra magic. But cool. basically what, what Greg has described is something that we have built in the past, just Linux-based, not Trinaz-ish. I'm not afraid of given up the uh, true NAS. Um, when I when I accepted this position, there's already a couple of uh, installations of it here, and I'm a fan of being consistent, even if it's not the most optimal choice. Um, so I just stuck with it because uh, the, the other people in the group already knew how to operate with it and whatnot, so it seemed pretty easy decision to make. And when you say true NAS, that was from memory, a few core systems and one scale or a bunch of scale? Yeah, the, no, the, this one's the first uh, scale one, the first okay. Linux one. Hmm. Yeah, um, and that's only, again, because I couldn't get the FreeBSD variant to go on that machine. Mm -hmm. well, don't tempt me. What, 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 can you paraphrase what went wrong, although your headline of the next little ticket might tell us. So, oh, AMD, interesting. Oh, uh, so it's an Epic based Dell. Yeah. Did you have an issue with spinning disks or NVMe? Um, it was neither. I believe like the installer would just quit like really early to say sure. waiting. Yeah. You'll see it here. Okay. It doesn't even get to user land. It's stuck waiting for a root uh, file system to mount or for devices to scan for a root file system to mount. Yeah, that at a chains frames, that was a common error I seen. That's a classic. Absolutely be sure your HBA is up to date on firmware. And, and go ahead. And there's yeah, a panic. <laughs> no, that was, uh, 
Menu lens triggered, right? No. What was that, Jan? So um, what I do on high discount systems is intentionally disable the option ROMs and boot from a pair of SATA SSDs because UEF, neither UEFI nor BIOS boot on older systems is really designed for 90 or so disks to show up. It's a pain to pick the right devices. Uh, and if I know that the boot devices aren't behind the HPA, I don't need the option run slowing down the reboot even more, just to have me wait five seconds um, to put, interrupt and then, yeah, just look at things I can also view at runtime. MPR, is that the hardware RAID controller or no. not? Drawing a blank here, but yeah, when given a choice, do stick with the strict HBA one. And for the Dells, like an HBA three thirty. One thing that sticks out to me is we have an MPR that has firmware twenty four zero 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 on it, running against a FreeBSD driver that's designed for firmware twenty three zero 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 zero. Right there. Yeah, that's a firmware. That's a that's an HBA firmware mismatch with the kernel. Yeah. That I that's I mean the HBA is running newer firmware, which means it may spit out things that the driver does not understand. But um yeah, just try again with 14. Well, I, yeah, just we need to go look at the driver, the NPR driver, to see what firm level it is on at fourteen. But, yeah, yeah, I I'd simply say go with a Dell HPA three thirty or equivalent, and even the firmware through the this, GUI updates work. Just saying, the, the NPR is an excellent piece of hardware. Is that the hardware RAID variant or HPA? It's an HPA. It's an HPA. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. actually, so it, could be, a it could be HPA. firmware either way. Yep. Yeah, but make sure it's in uh, in HPA mode or firmware. Yeah. yeah, it was. The unfortunate thing was um, when we bought this, or we already had this Dell server, and when I decided that I was going to use it for this purpose, I went out and bought a LSI HBA SAS controller. Yeah. And I stuck it in the uh, Dell server, and the Dell server wouldn't post with it. Um, turns out that it's not on their qualified list, and Dell has decided, I guess, to mask things that they don't qualify if they offer a equivalent to it. Hmm. Um, yeah, well, so... They, 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 oh, you mean the... Uh... Fuck you, pay me a uh, feature in their BIOS. Uh, maybe, but Rod, you had something because I've I've heard those yeah, stories. The, M the MPR driver yet. is half of LSI's product line. It's it's all it's it's the SAS driver. They're all the yeah. three thousand series cards. Yeah, that's that's what my next statement is going to be. This card that I bought, I looked at what Dell sold, and I purposely bought this. They're they're the same yeah. character verbatim. Um, just yes. you know the yeah the they put their own logo and the word Dell in the in the firmware. Yeah, they don't somewhere. even they don't even put Dell firmware on these if I remember right. Yeah, hmm. absolutely verify your firmware version because that uh, reeks for me. <laughs> on the but, older ones like the R seven twenty or seven thirty, they had integration in their uh, lights out management in iDrag to basically manage the hardware rate with the firmware. Correct. And so basically what, so that uh, you don't have to deal with the scary rate controller from Windows and Windows just gets the out of band configured volume on your shiny new hardware rate controller uh, if you're stuck with Windows. Uh, and now you are locked into their ecosystem. So yeah. That's okay. one of the reasons why um, you have problems uh, with LSA, LSI chips on their servers um, if you want to run the normal cards. They treated are, me well um, for what it's worth. There are document uh, snippets of documentation 
uh, about which combinations can be made to work correctly anyway by either disabling the Dell stuff or flashing the right firmware on the card. So the, yeah. Are you sure you're not confusing the Dell servers with the HP servers? Because I can tell you that is true of the HP servers for sure. But it seems like a lot of people are saying they're not, they don't see that on the Dell as much. So I've seen it personally only on an R720. So old stuff. I've been told that the R730 is the same. Oh, uh, it, it depends on which HBA yeah. or I, which version. you have in there. If you have one of the the newer MPR type cards, Dell doesn't bastardize the firmware in there. They just use the system management stuff to be able to do all the stuff from the IDRAC side, as far as I recall. There, there are Dell specific RAID cards that I've even, I've got a bunch of 720s and I don't think I've ever had any trouble with the 720 interacting with FreeBSD's driver. But, um, only those that supports. So if you have a card where IDRAC doesn't support, it doesn't mess with it. Oh, it doesn't. So. So speaking of which, where is SAS 4? We're going to see it? Because NVMe kind of took over for all flash and all flash SAS has been a weird kind of bastard stepchild territory. So, uh, is there a so can spinning going to see devices spinning keep disc. up with a faster interface or not? Go ahead, Jan. We're probably going to see spinning disks hooked up to NVMe fabrics. Mm. Okay. Because there is an extension for that. And yeah. Okay. Why uh, force the faster storage through the compatibility layer when you can. Yeah, well, but it doesn't have the kind of concurrent operations anywhere near Flash. <clears throat> and ooh, of course ooh, ooh, not, did, but. Did someone mention uh, an LSI 9500 performing, a tri-mode card performing just overall slower than a direct uh, older card for pure non-NVMe SAS? I heard that comment, but I forget where it's from. Man, I picked one up cheap on eBay, so I'll try to bench it. That sounds sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, is it an urban legend, or do we have some hard numbers? Because I do well, totally accept that tri mode is a miraculous proposition, and hopefully it's proven. But it's also kind of apples and oranges in the same basket. Cool. Yeah, and how to cripple your NVMe flash so that it's not any faster than SAS uh, dual ported. Especially when it comes to low Q depth, high IOPS loads. Cool. Anything else? No, I'm good. Um, oh. Just, just. Well, just mention this. I was playing Please. around with the buffer sizing because uh, a few weeks ago we were on a call and I was talking about uh, um, data transfer protocols, saturating links and whatnot. And uh, somebody had mentioned that um, you could do that with FTP because I said you couldn't uh, by tuning the uh, buffer network buffers and whatnot. Um, I'm still unable to even come close to doing that. I don't know. If anyone has a uh, a reference or whatever, I'd be more than happy to give that a shot. I just don't see FTP being able to compete with uh, multi-streaming or multi-threaded protocols. If, so you have if, a hard requirement for FTP? Just go ahead. Go no, ahead. no, not at all. Okay. Um, somebody was asking me why why we'd want to use like a commercial file transfer application or that uh, UDP or an FTP pages that I mentioned last time about mm -hmm. the open source equivalent. Um, and they said you can saturate a network interface with FTP if you adjust your buffers properly to match the network. Um, but I still haven't the, seen it. The approach. thing to watch, 
the thing to watch for is to run a TCP dump on the transfer. And um, are you running? Let me think about this. Um, well, you should be. Is what you want to look and see what the congestion window size caps out at. Okay. And see if the congestion window um, Wireshark will give it to you. You can see it in a TCP dump too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if see if it gets to where the to close to what the bandwidth delay product is of the connection. If the connection window is not growing to that, um, it, it it'll never saturate, and that's the, the that means something else needs tweaked. Fair enough. Okay. It's just you're not getting enough traffic in flight. All right, so the congestion window size and so WND, yeah, yeah, is, yeah, and that's a dynamic thing that is controlled by max receive buffer, max send buffer, and a bunch of other parameters and stuff that that restrict it from getting too big. Um, Interesting. CWND was that CWND. Thank you, and I have one that might be interesting. Just one sec. Uh, that conversation planted a few keywords in my head and I saw this post that I'll drop in the chat and I'll drop in the doc, which was about packet fragmentation and a, I believe a bash script to analyze it. So let's see what we've got here. Um, whoop, no, clicky clicky. So you think you understand IP fragmentation. Okay, so there is that. And is this someone with a script? And let's see what this is. And SH, path MT discovery using MT, ICMP echo requests. So, this is indeed what I came across, but if it helps here, I cannot say. But they this came up. Go ahead. Yeah. Becomes relevant, then you have links with different um, MTU MTUs. along your path. MTUs, and yeah. on the in internet, you kind of have, unless one of the edge networks has a lower MTU, you can normally assume 1500. Mm -hmm. And anything beyond that becomes a problem. Yep. So anyway, that jumped out now that I'm I'm attuned to listening to these uh, topics. So if if anyone has other utilities that help out, I am all ears. IPERF three is a preferred tool when you're trying to diagnose a congestion link bandwidth capability. It'll IPERF three literally reports the the. In use CWND size for the TCP flows that it's it's sending. Cool. Most of the time, when using multiple connections in IPERF improves your throughput, then you have a path empty. You uh, sorry bandwidth delay or not on your path, which is higher than the congestion window size, but. Okay, the other so, thing is that with FTP or Raptor or whatever, you can use multiple connections uh, to, but yeah. There are the advantages that you can uh, use multiple paths. So one thing which uh, even perfectly tuned uh, buffer sizes uh, and congestion windows don't give you is the ability to make use of equal cost multipath routing capacity with a single connection or LACP uh, bundles because it's still only one flow and it all hashes to the same hash bucket and thereby all goes across the same link. Yeah, depending on the algorithm you're using, but yeah. The common ones put one TCP connection uh, packet into the same link. Mm -hmm. So to preserve ordering inside the flow. Yeah, because if you're around Robin, you might get into out of sequence issues. Yeah, but you can totally trash your throughput. Yeah. So paraphrasing you, you say if you see 
benefits from multiple streams in iperf 3 you probably have congestion control issues or did i mishear if that you do see it uh, not congestion over the control okay you have a congestion window thank you issue thank you uh, at least with uh, wide area latencies if it's within your let's say campus network or something then it's more likely that it's something along the lines of multiple paths uh, you can't use concurrently for the, the same flow but yeah Cool. The short answer, iperf three is your friend for diagnosing. as always it depends It depends. Fair enough. Other topics, it's your call, not mine. and if greg if you didn't participate uh uh I think two weeks ago, Rod uh, spelled out the math for the calculation. I must have missed that, um, but I'll look at the notes. Yeah, just scroll down on this doc, but yes, indeed. Thank yeah. you for pointing that out. We're, uh, Rod, do you know if we had sort of a, 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 a decimal point off or we're good? <laughs> Oh, I don't. I remember thinking something after the call that that there was something wrong with that calculation. It just it didn't stick in my head as being the right number. Okay, so in broadly, this can't be too clear for people because it comes up all the time. And I suspect people are throwing hardware at issues that are just like TCP issues. So just saying. It gets TCP getting high performance out of TCP gets tough anytime you leave the data center at high speeds. Yeah, that's that's why I think a lot of these uh, applications that I had spoke of, they're using UDP. I guess that's so they can control their own window sizing, perhaps. Um, no, it doesn't. It, no matter what, you have to control the, the congestion window, the amount of tra traffic you have in flight. Don't, it doesn't matter whether you do it with TCP or if you write your own controller in UDP, you, you end up doing the same thing. And... Okay. If I remember correctly, at least one of them supports using raw sockets or a, t a ton device to basically implement a user space TCP stack so that they can violate the kernel's uh, safety features uh, against uh, congestion and have their own unfair congestion control uh, algorithms in user space. which is as cursed as it sounds. I'm looking for a book. I think it was Network Flow Analysis. I don't know if that's Lucas or what, but hopefully it's on the show. That sounds like a Cisco press book. <laughs> Found it. Just one sec. The O'Reilly series. I thought I heard the word NetFlow in there, and NetFlow is a Cisco thing. But... Yeah. Oh, Network Flow. Michael W. Lucas. Oh. Don't search that without the W. Um, um, let's... That book is really dated. Uh, yeah, the first thing I'm looking in the front here, it was... TCP 60s. is almost 50 years old. It works just yeah. fine. <laughs> 2010 One of the problems is a with book. it is that the software he... Structures his book around that has never gained IPv6 support. And it's basically abandoned a few two years or so The after principles the book came out. of the congestion window and in flight and what you have to do Well, in networking I'd has let not him finish. changed in 50 years. It hasn't changed between IPv4 and IPv6. It's all the same math. Sure, TCP works the same on top of both. Well, if you're trying to get to max bandwidth, the saturation length, the math is the same. Independent of underlying product. In fact, the, the math applies to XNS or X25 or or Apple Talk if you want to. Uh, with Apple Talk, yeah, well, they have other problems. IPX. <laughs> IPX too. Let's go to SNA. Come on, let's have some real fun.
So I'm not seeing a congestion okay. control section in the index, but what else would I look for? Window. This, no, you, you're lucky. You keep you keep conflating because we talked about a congestion window, and you keep conflating that with congestion control, and they are two different. Well, well congestion really window. Thing. Okay. It, it, it will also be in, uh, in flight, data in flight. Um, and um, the book may not get into the subject. I mean, it's a. You it's may find. Or, or, um, if you control the switches, you may also want to look into the SNMP uh, maps to f uh, find the drop packet counters or the queue depth so that uh, you know if you're suffering from bursty behavior. Yeah, that's a, look at watching the congestion window, it, those events show up in the congestion window control of TCP pretty rapidly. If, if you get a packet loss, the congestion window will shrink. And if you see the congestion window oscillating, you're you're getting packet loss or something else triggering that. Right. Yep. Which I mean, if you're if you're trying to drive things to the point of saturation, you are going to experience a a packet loss. Hopefully, you're running with ECN turned on, um, explicit congestion notification, so that you don't actually have to incur a loss. You can just incur a CE mark. Um, things will will oscillate between. Two bandwidths, one being the capacity of the link and one being something less than that, usually 80% of it. And the other thing you can see is uh, Ethernet flow control kicking in at the back pressure, bringing down whole swaths of your uh, network to a crawl. Because as buffers fill up, instead of dropping things, mis uh, well meaning, but still. Uh, troublesome misconfigurations can cause this back pressure to block off ever larger parts of your network. When people try to avoid dropping a frame too hard. Anything else? I am good. Awesome. I'll see some of you tomorrow for Beehive, and thank you all for attending. I suppose I can hang around a few minutes, but I'll call it at one fifty-seven Pacific. Yeah. Thanks, gang. You guys Thanks all have care, a good everybody. day. Yep. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.